I, it was really stimulating and and frank set of discussions. And um, I think we didn't solve the problem, but um, we at least articulated the problem. And I think that that was that was really good. And so, you know, I think um, the challenge, I think we made clear that, you know, there's um, not not only a prospect for an ultimately unfunded mandate, but but really just a more general unsolved problem. And I think the critical question going forward is, you know, when we look at making open science happen, you know, it is is grassroots going to get us there? collaborations and partnerships, or do we need a sort of higher authority really directing traffic and, and paying attention? Um, can the funders provide more information about how it's going, right? You know, how, how they see things progressing are, are, is what they want to happen actually happening. And if not, you know, why is that? Is it because there isn't enough money in the system? Is it because there isn't enough crosstalk? Um, you know, there's a talk about making sure that costs stay reasonable. What is reasonable? Is reasonable going to evolve? And um, then there's a question of um, what is particular about chemistry? Are, are there elements of open science in chemistry that, um, you know, we, we, we need to think about um, a little bit more, more specifically and, and, and drill down a little more. Um, I, I mentioned to uh, Sarah, I'm extremely excited to see the ACS repository come online. It's going to be really interesting to see um, how, how that, that endeavor might, might um, facilitate data deposition. Um, I'm also generally excited about a lot of the repositories that have been making headway and um, I think you you heard Ale say, you know, the NSF runs this repository. Why don't they push people to put their data there? And and I think that's that's a question that um, you know we as a community need to keep asking the NSF, right? Because you know they're already putting money into it. The community already supports it. How can we um, you know actually benefit from that synergy? And so I think um, those are those are all questions that we. I think talked through productively, and now we need to take that information and um, help uh, help other people in the community, and and especially um, program officers and people affiliated with funders, um, help them understand that we want to help them help us um, facilitate open science. Thanks so much, Jake. <laughs> For inspiring. Um, I think we did a lot of excellent, just following up on what you said, Jake, I think we did a lot of excellent problem statement articulation. And I think that's always going to be your first step in trying to unpack a really large area like this. Um, and, you know, I, I definitely took note that, you know, we're not only coming into a, a, what sounds like a whole new, you know, mandated space, but actually, you know, we're looking at a, an ecosystem that needed to evolve probably quite a long time before this that isn't quite fully working that isn't quite sustainable. So we do have a broader responsibility, both as a domain, um, you know, but also an ecosystem of research. Um, you know, what, how does this, how does this move forward, not only for, you know, new areas of, of innovation and technology, um, but just to sustain the scholarly uh, research that we have valued in this country. So that's one thing. Um, Thinking about um, the problems of, you know, how will global and sector variabilities impact the research experience? Um, thinking about equity implications. Uh, on the one hand, a um, whole plethora of policies and different expectations about what data where, you know, what data models, what publishing models, what fees might be associated with it. So we're, we're, we're definitely in a transitionary zone. So I think this, we're going to need to evolve that. Um, one thing that did jump out at me, we didn't really talk too much about this, but maybe this is something we could um, dig into a little bit more tomorrow, is um, a lot of great activities starting to come up. Lots of communities and different stakeholders working on this, still all feeling a little bit siloed. Um, how do we collaborate even more? How do we not end up with a lot of fair silos <laughs> so that you're, you know, you just need to go to each data system like you always have gone to each data system and need to understand and learn how to work with each, um, each process or each publisher's policies. So I think that might be something that we wanna uh, dig into um, 
uh, a little bit more to, um, I really uh, think that reproducibility, maybe that could be a helpful framework to think about these problems going forward too. I heard um, issues of very of reproducibility coming up both in wet lab scenarios, you know, with the, with the smoking or the evolving cells, but what about computation? I think actually um, Olaf and Ali spoke both to that, that there's a lot of um, uh, variability that happens in those environments as well. And so maybe reproducibility, if that's a high, if that's an important value to this domain, um, you know, where do we want to go with that? What do we want, you know, the outcome of, of this effort to give us? Can we improve um, reproducibility in our research um, as a positive, you know? So not only step out of a long time long-term challenging research environment, but actually be able to evolve um, our domain towards towards values, um, you know, that we that we can improve our science on. So I think there's a lot of opportunity, but it, it's just a lot of work. And I think we're starting from my perspective as a librarian, and I'll probably just echo Elaine here, I can't help it. <laughs> the librarians, we see, we see the back end of things. <laughs> we're the last stop. Help, you know, if everybody comes to us for help. It, it we are in a uh, we are in a turning point. I think we have to make this a turning point, um, whether or not um, all of the efforts that we're seeing go forward uh, are generalizable or appropriate for all different communities of practice. Um, everybody does have to make a, a turn here. We can't keep publishing and, and doing research this way. Um, new career, new career uh, students, they need new skills. Industry is evolving, <laughs> globalizing, um, pandemics are happening. <laughs> we, you know, we do really need to to make a turn. So I'm not quite coherent, but just sort of a lot to. There's a lot that happened today. That's great. <laughs> so I think tomorrow, um, our panel, our last panel, is going to be focusing um, if we can dig in a little bit more on what actually can we do to support the research community. Um, and I think we could break that down into terms of what's happening now to support the research community. Are there things that are happening now that, you know, that we can make more broadly available and broaden the awareness of? And how, how can we, you know, what are the next steps in, in improving services um, and support um, for translating some of these directions into practice, um, particularly for the research community? Uh, as the authors and of publications, as the generators of data that that we want to be shared. Um, so we're going to be having our last panel. We'll be hearing from a small research um, uh, institution. We'll be hearing from industry, and then we'll be hearing from uh, the librarian community specific support services around chemistry um, and around data curation in the library context. And that'll wrap us up for this workshop. All right. And so we'll see you all. Yes, 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 Mark. Yeah, 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 because yeah, yeah, they're on Zoom. Thank you so much. Yeah. For... <laughs> I was going to say we'll see you all tomorrow at 9, but wait, there's more. I observation. Um, you know, I come from an industrial background. Many people here are talking what I would claim in a very academic way. You have Mackenzie Scott, uh, Bill Gates, all these people out there giving money. When we talk about things like the protein data bank, it seems like we might be a little bit myopic if we only think that federal government is the only funds that can go towards something like that. If we can express that they are useful and maybe the National Academies could help do that, that some of these repositories might be funded by somebody philanthropic. Gates put a ton of money into one of the largest cancer studies that was ever done. McKenzie Scott's done a lot of other things that are around science. So it might be if we can make the case that that's another bucket of money that could help solve some of the issues that we're talking about here. stimulated a little bit of follow-up conversation. <laughs> Just can't get enough. Well, we, I, I kind of skipped over it, but the Schmidt Foundation, uh, Schmidt Futures are actually funding uh, the ORD. Yeah, I mean, you know, Gates Foundation was a big driver of open access around the time that Plan S kicked into gear. I mean, there was, um, you know, I think one of the reasons that um, the U.S., 
even long prior to the Nelson memo. One of, one of the reasons that that the U.S. Um, got wrapped up in the Plan S frenzy was because the Gates Foundation had an open access mandate, and um, you know that was uh, sort of particularly tied around the CCBY license and um, you know making research not just free to read but free to compile in in various forms and so yeah they've been they've been very involved and you know they're um you know like like most very wealthy foundations they have strings attached to what they want to pay and when which is fine i mean you know that's 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 how they work but you know it's not it's certainly not a situation where where they're just you know standing there offering money you know there there there's there's a lot of but uh, well right yeah no i i yeah all right more to come <laughs>